All right, today we're going to talk about wildlife habitat relationships. And in particular, for this presentation, I'm going to show you uh, several terms that are associated with wildlife habitat management and what those actually mean, how we use them correctly and incorrectly, and how they relate as a whole to the management that we would apply on the ground when we're trying to manage wildlife species. So the history of habitat is pretty interesting and basically this concept was derived from curiosity about how animals interact with their environment and it came from observations just that animals did not necessarily occur everywhere that they could. There were environmental gradients that are governing the distributions of animals. So what you're looking at is an example here from Florida. You can see the historical range of bears across the state was distributed pretty much ubiquitously. But because of many changes in the structure of vegetation across the landscape and habitat fragmentation, along with some other factors, that was severely restricted uh, even as, as late as the 1970s. And we then aggressively started protecting bears and uh, managing for different things. You may be uh, familiar with the a wildlife corridor which is actively trying to connect all of this in a long corridor of vegetation that will support these species. So this is the kind of thing that we're talking about. Clearly but the bear range is being limited by things other than just what environmental conditions they can survive in or what climate they can survive in. So this is what really spurred the interest in habitat and the related concepts that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. So first, I think we need to talk about what is and what is not habitat. You probably use it in frequently, incorrectly, and I know if you are around in our field that you hear it used incorrectly very commonly. Habitat is strictly the set of resources that's necessary to support a population through time. So that's pretty important. Let's think about why we misuse that. So one thing that is pretty important about habitat is that it is species specific. So if you look at this range map here, you can see the historical range of longleaf pine. If you overlay the range of gopher tortoises on that, it's pretty much contained within that. So we would call longleaf pine ecosystem gopher tortoise habitat. So that actually is pretty accurate for that species, but if we called longleaf pine habitat, that would be an incorrect way of using that term. We are conflating, in that case, long the Longleaf Vegetation Association with habitat. And here's a good reason to illustrate why that isn't accurate. So let's think about a, a facetious example. Do whales live in longleaf pine? Absolutely not. That would be completely ridiculous, right? It isn't habitat for that species. So here, here's the thing that you really need to understand about the term habitat. It is a species specific concept because everything is habitat for something and not habitat for many other things. So this is a pretty important concept and we're going to go over it in the class repeatedly because it is nearly ubiquitously misused in our field and it's important for us to be specific about these kinds of terms to make sure that we communicate effectively with one another and even uh, potentially more importantly to communicate these concepts with the general public. Okay, now that you understand what habitat is and is not, let's go a little bit further and talk about some other terms associated with habitat management. So first of all, habitat includes four components. That includes food, water, cover, and space. Those are the four general things that all have to be 
present in adequate quantities to support a population for it to qualify as habitat for that species. Habitat selection is the process where animals are choosing areas based on biological and abiotic characteristics such that they acquire enough food, water, cover, and space. So if you look at this map over on the right side right here, this is pretty typical of what you might see if we did a habitat selection study for a species. We may radio tag individuals. You could also create this with a grid of camera traps, which I've done with some of the students in my lab. But in general, what you're looking at right here is habitat selection by the species in this study. If you would like to see the study, I have it linked right here. Uh, the species doesn't even matter. What you can see is that the colors are different and the colors are associated with the intensity of use by the animal. The red are places that they intensively use. The blue, they are basically avoiding. And this is pretty typical that we see from individuals in a population. They don't evenly use the landscape because resources such as food, water cover, and uh, space are unequally available to them across the landscape. Now you may think, well, what about how is space unequally available? Well, we're talking about usable space. So there may be uh, places in this landscape, for instance, if there is a lake right here, and this is a terrestrial mammal, there is space there, but it's not usable for the species. So all of these things have to be in adequate quantities to support habitat, and habitat selection is the active and innate response of the animal to choose the features in the landscape that provide those things. All right, let's talk about a couple of terms that we use interchangeably sometimes, but they don't technically overlap perfectly. So the difference between habitat use and habitat selection is pretty important, and we, it's not necessarily intuitively uh, intuitive that they're different. So habitat use is simply the way that the animal is using or consuming the resources in its habitat. Habitat selection is this process where the animal takes knowledge that it gains from using its habitat and then makes decisions from that learned experience on how to better utilize it in the future. So it's a process that's evolving over time as the animal learns more about what's going on in its environment. When we think about habitat selection, we can couch that into a couple of other uh, terms that are pretty important. So preference is basically as habitat selection proceeds and the animal learns where the best places are, we'll see a disproportionate use of some resources relative to others. That'd be a habitat preference. Habitat availability, like I said on the previous slide, is simply how accessible is the resource uh, to the individual. So if you had a small island in the middle of a lake that had excellent forage for an animal that can't swim, then it may not be usable or accessible to that animal, even though it would be good food. So uh, that's a good way to think about it. Habitat quality is the ability of a given habitat to provide resources. The only way that we can actually measure habitat quality is to link that to demography. So what do I mean here? So habitat quality would be based on, let's say uh, we have a population of squirrels. If we looked at the reproductive capability and what level of population could be sustained in a given habitat, we would have to compare that to another habitat with those same demographic factors to rank them relative to one another in terms of their quality. The one that can support more or higher reproduction would be a higher quality. However, so how do we link demography to anything? That's something that's, that we're gonna talk about a lot in this course, but before we get into uh, more detail about linking demography to habitat, let's think about 
uh, some fundamental concepts about habitat quality. By the way, make sure that you go and read the Van Horn paper that I provided you in the module. So when she wrote that paper, she was making a really fundamental contribution to our field. And what she was trying to articulate in, in that paper is that habitat quality is actually a density dependent function, right? So let's look at this graph up in the top left here. You can, in theory, say, okay, we have habitat A and habitat B. If we hold the density of animals, let's say it's uh, squirrels again. If we have 10 squirrels, let's say that that's uh, this density right here, 10 squirrels in habitat B would, would have a lower high habitat quality than 10 squirrels in habitat A. All right, so the fitness of those populations would be quite different. However, habitat A and B at different densities could actually have the same fitness, right? So if we had 10 squirrels in habitat B and let's say 20 squirrels in habitat A, the relative habitat quality of each of these to those individual populations of squirrels would be dependent on the number of squirrels in the environment. That was a fundamental contribution because we were trying to use density as our sole indicator of habitat quality. And of course, she articulates a bunch of reasons why that is a poor way for us to be thinking about it. The, to go along with that concept, density dependent, what, all we're talking about is things change as you change the density of animals in the given habitat. So habitat quality itself, this is just kind of showing you that. At a low density of animals, maybe they're fighting, we've got squirrels fighting over acorns. When there are only a few squirrels, habitat quality may be very high. But as you add squirrels, and hence uh, competition for those resources, as you add density, that habitat quality declines. Right, and when it's been measured, it typically declines in a function very similar to this. And wonder why it's getting flat out here. Why? Think about that for a minute. Why do you think the uh, habitat quality would no longer be density dependent out here? It's kind of the same thing here. It's not very sensitive to density right here compared to right here on the line. And what's going on is, if you haven't thought of it already, let's talk about that. Now, we're, we've hit a, a critical threshold where there's so many squirrels that adding more squirrels is not adding more competition. And that could happen for a variety of reasons uh, because maybe competition for a different resource takes over or maybe they've already depleted all the acorns, right? If, if all the squirrels ate all the acorns, then adding more squirrels is not going to result in fewer acorns anymore because there already aren't any. So same thing on this end of the graph, you know, uh, squirrels may be, be able to find as many acorns as they want for a large portion. Like, you know, one squirrel can find all they want, even if there's two squirrels or three squirrels. But at some point, that increasing the number starts to deplete the quality of resource availability for an individual. Okay, so... I asked you a minute ago to think about how do you how do you link demography to anything? So let's think about caribou for a minute, right? So we're talking about literally the scale right here is out to 2,000 kilometers, all right? So think about what we're talking about. If we were gonna measure habitat quality for caribou, they're using this entire area. We in theory, all of this habitat selection incorporating all of this area is all contributing to the animal's reproduction, their fitness, right? Their relative fitness. So this is an inherent problem that we have when we're trying to measure habitat quality. We don't know what out of this landscape is contributing what proportion to what part of the animal or the population's fitness. And that can make it really difficult and potentially even impossible to, to measure. 
Another thing is, what does fitness actually mean? So how many generations of reproduction do we need to include, for instance, right? So are we talking about just the how many uh, calves did the caribou population wean this year? Or are we talking about how many calves did they, they uh, wean over their lifetime in the population? It gets really tri tricky to start measuring some of these things. So we tend to use a metric of fitness and we, uh, to be frank about it, often just, just uh, arbitrarily set what that's gonna be. So if we were gonna compare habitat quality for, for uh, caribou, we might try to look at the, the relative reproduction of the population for a three year period because that's how long we're gonna study them, right? and we would, we would rank habitat quality based on that. Another thing that we pretty commonly do, which based on our discussion up till now, you'll realize is probably not the most uh, accurate way to think about it, but we do, we do this is we would look at habitat use when we study it, like you're seeing in this right here, and <clears throat> we uh, use something like this resource selection function, and this literally is using habitat use to determine what habitat quality is based on the perception of the animal. So that's making a couple of assumptions. One, we're assuming that the animal knows what's best, and two, we're assuming that uh, the quality of the resource is perfectly reflected in that selection, even though they may be acquiring different resources that are all necessary in the different locations, right? So uh, there's some inherent problems, and if you have questions about this, well, I'm happy to talk about it during our discussions uh, throughout the course, but uh, the thing that you need to really understand is it's really hard for us to measure these things, and it makes uh, some of this these studies a little more difficult to carry out and interpret into actionable management. All right, another fundamental concept is the concept of a niche or niche. I know you've probably heard about this, but I just wanted to review it with you. Uh, so we're basically talking about the distribution of a single species, including its habitat use, its diet, and the constraints on that that come from competition or predator avoidance. And basically a fundamental niche is the potential distribution of a species, whereas the realized niche is where we actually observe it given the constraints that it has. So for instance, uh, if you look over in the right side in this uh, figure here, you can see that these different warblers, this is a classic example from MacArthur, uh, showing that the, the uh, different warbler species are all confined to even different parts of the same tree. So they are actually segregating the use of that tree as a resource. And that's kind of an example of a realized niche. A fundamental niche would be what happens to a particular species when you remove the competition. So right now, when they're all there, they segregate their use. But if you remove four of them, the yellow rumped warbler, let's say, uh, this is just a completely hypothetical example. But if we removed all the other warblers and the yellow rumped warbler then started using the whole tree, the fundamental niche for the yellow rumped warbler would be the entire tree, whereas the realized niche is this peach colored portion right here that it's constrained to giving its competition. So that's really the, the big difference between the fundamental and realized niche. This is really important. We're gonna talk about uh, a full seer. This is what we're actually managing on the landscape. And because of the niche of different species, we can, and we can uh, use different kinds of practices to affect vegetation structure based on our knowledge of succession uh, throughout a seer and what the niche of the given species that we're interested in is in that, in that community. So very important basic concepts that we're gonna use throughout this course 
uh, when we're talking about habitat management. So you saw earlier when we were talking about habitat selection and we were talking about that happening, happening at different scales. So if we uh, wanted to, to classify those, they're, they're classified into orders of selection. And basically the first order of selection is the decision made at the geographic range. So the example I gave you with the gopher tortoise, the entire geolog geographic range of that species is in the southern coastal plain. And it turns out there's a really important factor in the southern coastal plain that limits it to that range, which is the sandy soil that it can burrow in uh, combined with the climate. That is a really important suite of characteristics that determines its geographic range and that would be the first order of selection. The second order of selection is the home range that the animal chooses. So here's an example with some movement data and we've just calculated a home range based on all the relocations of an animal that's radio tagged. That within its geographic range is the second order of selection. So the geographic range of the species itself is the first order the selection or establishment of a home range by an animal within a population or species uh, within that geographic range is, is the second order. You see right here, we have a wild turkey with some poults. If you uh, ride down the road about, let's say uh, early June for a large portion of Northern Florida, you may see a whole bunch of hens out in pastures or out in early successional communities with poults. They're actually choosing a specific habitat component, and that is early succession that allows them to uh, get adequate insect resources for, to uh, maximize growth for the poults. So they're really little guys. They're growing rapidly skeletal-wise and their feathers, and that's a really high protein requirement. Their diet is almost exclusively insects, and these kinds of communities, these early successional communities, we'll talk about uh, this with old field management a lot in the course, these provide the structure and insect abundance and thermal environment that allows these poults to meet those requirements during that time. That's third order selection. So they're selecting early succession within their home range to, uh, uh, to uh, do brood rearing. Here we're, we see this video of a squirrel. He's grabbed an acorn and he's going over here and burying it. So pretty cool footage from one of our studies. This is the fourth order of selection where the animal is actually procuring a resource from the the uh, habitat component that it has selected. All right, now that you have learned about all the, the uh, different habitat terms and related that to, to animals, let's switch gears a little bit and start talking about disturbance ecology. So when we were talking about the concept of a niche and animals all have different parts of the community or different community structure and composition that they associate with for their habitat, we largely can influence and promote those different aspects for species based on concepts that we understand in disturbance ecology. So uh, largely what we need to understand and what we're going to talk about a lot in this course are different types of disturbances, but also key aspects of those disturbances that affect wildlife. So if you look in the, the bottom here, the effects of disturbances, so let's, let's take fire for example, is depicted by the frequency, intensity, duration, location, and extent of the disturbance. So what are we talking about? If we're in a pine stand like this and we have this low intensity fire going across it, that has a far different effect on all of the species in the community, plants and animals alike, than a catastrophic wildfire would have. Okay, so this is the type of practice we're using right here, and uh, the lack of that has resulted in a lot of what you see uh, in, on 
the media about fire, which are these catastrophic events. These are not the type of disturbances that we're using. That, that is far greater in intensity and in extent most of the time than we are trying to apply on the landscape. This is much more common for what we were doing for scrub fire. Hopefully you all will get some experience during this course applying this practice, uh, weather permitting. But that, that is, you know, it seems like a simple thing to understand, but we can, another way to look at it is let's just, we can use fire because it's so important for communities in our region. Uh, we can manipulate how often we put fire in there. We usually try to use a low intensity, but you can manipulate intensity. Uh, we usually are, are uh, manipulating dur duration. We're trying to keep it as short of a duration as possible. Uh, we don't want things to be burning for a long time, although that happens sometimes. Like if peat gets uh, caught on fire, you could have fires that last for months over a huge area. So. Uh, the primary things that we are manipulating in that disturbance is the frequency, the intensity, we're trying to minimize the duration when possible, and we can choose where we put it and how much area, so the extent to which we disturb. All of those things are within our control and we can manipulate even the same practice, in this case prescribed fire, we're going to talk about a bunch of other ones as well, we can manipulate all those factors about it to kind of uh, pinpoint the kinds of, of uh, community structure in the plant community that we want for a given wildlife species we're managing habitat for. So really quick, related to that, we generally have a few categories uh, that we would use to uh, understand the intensity of disturbance. You can see the uh, the geographic area and in, in, uh, the intensity of the disturbance are interacting. That's how we generally would uh, determine what kind of, of fire it is. We usually, with prescribed fire, are using this type four disturbance, where it's a local area and it's a fairly low intensity, okay? We're usually using fire at less than a thousand hectares and at a fairly low intensity, often uh, the flame height would even be below knee tall. I've uh, conducted many prescribed fires where you can literally step over the prescribed fire line and, and it not uh, be a problem at all. So when we're determining how to manipulate those different factors about disturbances, one of the things that we generally are trying to do when we want to manage habitat for a wide range of species that occupy different niche space, we might be trying to promote habitat heterogeneity. And what I'm talking about with that is just the degree of discontinuity in the environment. So changes in vegetation types and the structure and composition of those different vegetation types, we may be trying to increase that heterogeneity on the landscape, right? So that often I see get confused with fragmentation. And basically with fragmentation, that's still a measure of heterogeneity, but it really is about, uh, in, fragmenta in the case of fragmentation, it's really about the size of the area and how isolated that area is of vegetation patches usually uh, that'll support a given species, right? So the, the size and isolation of patches that will support habitat for, for a species. That could, another interesting thing about that, that could be fragmentation in space or time, right? That becomes really important when we start thinking about like uh, the forestry industry, for instance. We may have, uh, we may have a really high quality early successional community for about three years in a, in a you know, a com commercial loblolly pine stand, for instance. So we've gone into planted pines after a clear cut that may serve the uh, needs of early successional obligates for a few years. And then, you know, uh, it's no longer available. The, the, uh, 
temporal continuity is not normally thought of. It's more intuitive for whatever reason for us to think about space. But both of those things are critical, right? You could have the most pristine, highest habitat quality possible for a species for one second, and it probably cannot utilize that, right? So important concepts. Anyway, uh, when we're using these different disturbance types and trying to increase heterogeneity, there are some important things for you to think about. Uh, when you have that, basically, uh, let's start right here. We'll look at graph D. Generally, as you increase habitat heterogeneity, you tend to increase the number of species that can use it. But we hit a critical time where things become so heterogeneous that we start to see a decline in the species richness. So think about why would that be? If we go over to this graph right here, we start to see why. So as you increase heterogeneity, you get to a point where things are so heterogeneous that each individual patch is not a large enough effective area to support some of the species that would add to that species richness. So in a sense, it's becoming so heterogeneous that none of the components or the different uh, vegetation structure and, and composition associated with it are usable because none of them are big enough. That's a pretty important concept. Another thing, if you've taken uh, wildlife ecology with me, we talk about it quite a bit. Uh, we talk about <clears throat> island biogeography. That applies uh, very closely to habitat management because we tend to see an increase in species richness as you increase the area of habitat, right? So that's an important functional relationship. It applies in, in uh, most every system on the planet. It's really an interesting thing. And <clears throat> essentially, if we have, let's say we have a, an, a thousand, well, let's, let's say we have a hundred acres, 500 acres, and a thousand acres of the same exact plant community type. We would see a relationship like this. If you take the log of the relationship, it's easier to understand. It would be the straight line. So the slope of that line is essentially how fast we increase species richness as we increase area, okay? So if it was all homogeneous, the same type of, of uh, vegetation community and structure and composition, we would expect this line. What would happen if, you, if we were here on the heterogeneity of that? So we're, we're talking about it being very homogeneous, right? That's our line. What do you think would happen to the slope if we go from here on heterogeneity to here on heterogeneity? If you said that that slope would increase, you're correct. We would pick up species faster as we gained area because the heterogeneity community is providing an additional uh, benefit in terms of accumulation of species. So not only is the functional area important for accumulating species, but also the diversity or heterogeneity within that area that we're accumulating can also influence it. So they kind of add to one another and you end up with a steeper slope of accumulation. That is why you hear us talk about all the time, if you're listening to professionals that are managing habitat for wildlife species, we very commonly talk about managing for a mosaic or for habitat heterogeneity in plant communities because we're trying to not only increase the amount of area, but also increase the benefit to more species of the same amount of area with that uh, more heterogeneous management strategy. All right, let's talk about what influences habitat heterogeneity. So again, I know this lecture has been really term heavy, but I think it's important as a baseline for us to move forward in the class for you to understand these different things, especially if we're going to be using them throughout the course. So a corridor you're probably familiar with. I love this picture right here because I think it shows actually a lot of these terms all at once. 
The corridor in this case, as you probably have already realized, is this strip of vegetation right here. So notice it's long and linear and something you may not have, have uh, seen or it may not have been quite as obvious is this is actually a connecting uh, corridor between this really large patch of, of uh, forested area and there's also a large patch down outside the uh, picture that you can't see. This corridor is actually influencing the permeability of this landscape. So you can imagine, let's say uh, Panthers, for instance, this is one that's close to home where we've actually established a really awesome corridor in the state of Florida to uh, influence the permeability of the landscape so that we can connect these larger patches. So essentially what this means is animals in the patch that are off the screen here below this picture could more easily traverse this connection through the corridor to this than it would be to go through maybe the agriculture on the sides. You know, that exposure may not uh, be conducive for the animals to move through it. So this is actually influencing the permeability, I'm having trouble saying that word, apologize, of the landscape. So another thing that's really interesting about this picture is it also shows what we would call a hard edge. All right, so you can see how well defined this edge is right here. And basically in a hard edge, that is a, an extremely sharply defined ecotone. And notice the edge says sharply as part of the definition, but uh, in this case, we have a very high degree of difference in the vegetation structure between the two adjacent patches. So we have and a grassland here that's being used for cattle grazing. And you can see that we have that transition abruptly turns into forested area. That would be called a hard edge because it is a very high degree of difference in the edge between these two uh, communities. So the edge effect, another thing, you can't see it as well on this, uh, this picture, but it's really an important thing for you to understand. Because this vegetation is, is uh, open all the way down to the ground level and you know sunlight would be in, inside here would be captured primarily by the forest above. Well, what happens is sunlight is getting into the edge of this forest and you'll have a lot of early successional community plants that need a high sunlight environment. They would not occur in here, but they would occur right along the edge here because the, the uh, edge is getting more sunlight from the penetration from the side because of that, that, uh, that land use. So you'll see really actually in many cases it'll be fairly high quality early successional communities for species that need that, that uh, type of structure right along the edge in this kind of, of community. All right, so we've gone through several basic concepts about habitat and habitat use, how we use disturbances, interacting with those things. Here are some take home points for you to think about before we move on in content. One thing that I wanted to emphasize here, because we'll start talking about it quite a bit throughout the course, and even some of the, the activities that we do during the course are designed to show you or illustrate this point is, you know, we've been talking about wildlife sort of as a result of the disturbances that we apply to affect habitat. And uh, that's probably not the best way to, to be thinking about them. We should be thinking about wildlife as an integral part of the system. So not only do we apply disturbances that affect plant communities that then wildlife respond to, but because wildlife eat plants and vector plants by dispersing their seeds, those things could affect how plants respond to disturbances and ultimately uh, generate indirect effects on other species. 
That's an important concept for you to understand. It's something that is most commonly missing in my experience in our field. We're not thinking about the animals actually being a part of the way the system is functioning. And uh, for whatever reason, it seems hard for us to, to do that. It's important though, because people often apply these you know, very similar uh, disturbance regimes across sites and end up with different results. And just for instance, let me give you one example. <clears throat> if we applied fire to three or four sites that had wildly different deer densities, because deer respond to fire and they eat the plants and the level of herbivory might affect which plants can, can uh, withstand the, that herbivory, they might actually dictate whether or not the practice has a positive effect on other species, right? So it makes it site specific. So it's important for us to think about wildlife as playing an integral role in the disturbance regime that is uh, affecting vegetation. So that's something for you to think about. We're gonna talk about a lot more throughout the course, but I appreciate your time and look forward to talking to you more.